Today on this episode of The Crossover, we will be discussing the NASA James Webb Space Telescope with NASA Associate Administrator and Science Mission Directorate, Dr. Thomas Zerbukin. Find out how the most powerful telescope ever developed will help scientists come closer to answering the existential questions of where did we come from, are we alone, and how does the universe work? Much more on this episode of The Crossover. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be talking with Dr. Thomas Zerbukin about the James Webb NASA telescope. Hey, how are you? How's everything going, Dr. Zerbukin? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I just want to make sure, is there a way to put the volume up just a little bit more? Awesome. So while you're doing that, I'm just going to do a brief introduction. Again, thanks for spending the time with us and uh, yeah, super excited to talk to you about the James Webb Telescope. And you've obviously been very involved in that. So uh, today we have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Thomas Zerbukin. Uh, he's NASA Associate Administrator and Science Mission Directorate. Uh, his job is fairly complicated, you could say, for sure. Uh, he helps to try and answer questions such as where did we come from? Uh, are we alone? And how does the universe work? Uh, obviously not simple questions to answer. Uh, Dr. Zerbukin earned his doctorate and Master's of Science degree in physics from the University of Bern in Switzerland. Uh, prior to joining NASA, Dr. Zerbukin was a professor of space science and aerospace engineering at the University of Michigan. Uh, he was the founding director of Michigan's Center for uh, Entrepreneurship uh, at the College of Engineering and developed several innovation initiatives, one of which led to the top ranked entrepreneurship program nationally. Uh, what does he do on a daily basis? He works to ensure that NASA's uh, science missions build partnerships with other countries, other disciplines, and advance the frontiers of knowledge and exploration. Uh, he's had quite the career so far. Uh, he has over 200 peer-reviewed publications, and his honors include multiple NASA Ground Achievement Awards, induction as a member of the International Academy of Astronautics and the Swiss Academy of Engineering Sciences, a NASA Outstanding Leadership Medal, and the 2018 Heinrich Prize, which is uh, given to the leading science um, a scientist from the University of Bern. Uh, here, to, here today to discuss the James Webb uh, NASA telescope, uh, which is the most powerful telescope ever launched into space. So again, Thomas, thanks for joining us. Super excited to hear uh, your insights into this development. Thanks, I'm so glad to be here, Doc. So I just, I uh, really appreciate uh, and I can't wait for the, uh, for the discussion. Wonderful, well, you know, let's just start for the lay person here. What exactly is the James Webb Telescope if they haven't heard about it already? So I would really say it's a telescope of our generation, just the way the Hubble Space Telescope was the telescope of 30 years ago. Think of it as a facility, a telescope, which is magnificent both in scale and quality, that really is there to open up uh, a new way of looking at the universe. Uh, what we're specifically looking at uh, with this uh, telescope is at the infrared uh, universe. So think of it as instead of looking at what our eyes can see, which is visible light, we're looking at radiation that's heat. It's heat radiation. So why would anybody do that? Well, it's because over there in that spectrum, uh, you know, in that part of uh, the, the light, kind of the spectrum of light, it's all one spectrum, right? Over there is all the information about the early universe. And also there's information about uh, planetary atmospheres and when i'm talking about planetary i'm not talking about you know mercury venus and so forth uh, neptune i'm talking about planets outside of the solar system uh, we call those exoplanets so they're outside of our solar system and who exactly was james webb in case anyone wants to know how this was named yeah this telescope was named by a former nasa administrator uh, after the manager who really did the Apollo program. So if you really asked from the point of view of just managing the Apollo program, which of course is one of the biggest successes in NASA and frankly this country, uh, technological successes, uh, you know, James Webb was the manager that in many ways uh, created the vision. What's less known about him but is worth mentioning here, he actually had a strong vision of not only growing uh, the Apollo program, which of course is the big victory, the US flag on the moon, uh, uh, but also uh, actually grew the science enterprise in, within NASA. So he actually came up with uh, really the, the, you know, the importance of uh, using space to do science uh, discoveries, but also looking back at our home planet. 
interesting background. Now, tell us a little bit, how much more sophisticated is this telescope than, let's say, the Hubble telescope on a spectrum? Well, so you look at that uh, mirror, kind of one way to look at the telescope is always looking at that primary mirror. Kind of you, you observe any telescope, you go buy one at the store, the primary mirror may be, you know, a few inches. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope image uh, mirror is two and a half meters. So it's me lying down, stretching out my arms and so forth. I could just lie on it, right? Uh, just barely touch both. Well, this primary mirror is, uh, is six and a half meters or 21 feet, right? And, and that's massively bigger. Uh, so that's the one way you could look at it. If you look at the sensitivity and kind of the overall, uh, you know, just uh, uh, kind of where we're looking at the universe. Uh, again, uh, Hubble is visible ultraviolet, just a little bit into infrared. This one is all infrared, which made it a really different uh, telescope. If you look at the sensitivity in any one area, it could be, depending on the, the range you're looking at, of the order 100 times better. So something wow. that what you could look at uh, in one, kind of in one Hubble, uh, you know, um, filter, you know, a given, uh, a given color, and it takes you 100 seconds to accumulate a uh, web could do it in one, if you know what I mean, right? Kind of so, so it's, it's that kind of capability. And it's not just because of the mirror, it's also that the instruments are so advanced uh, that the noise in these instruments basically is non-existent, which is another way of saying it takes much less light to actually get a sharp image. Now, tell us a little bit, because people probably don't understand the amount of science and engineering that goes into developing something that is so sophisticated. Can you try to put it in perspective for us, the amount of work and science and engineering that went into the development of the James Webb Telescope? I, I, first of all, I, I think that is actually the most important part of the story. I love nature. I've looked at the night sky all my life. Frankly, the reason I turned to be an astrophysicist is because I love the night sky. I think it's important to look at the night sky. I think it's important to look at nature, understand it. You do it, you realize how important it is. Uh, but, uh, you know, think of the human achievement, right? So, so kind of, uh, there's a few numbers that I wanna talk to you about. So the first one is 10,000. Roughly speaking, that's how many individuals have actually directly been involved in just building the telescope, roughly wow. speaking. So, so well, who are those people? You know, some of them are engineers who are, and frankly, some of the best engineers I've ever met in my life, bar none. I mean, no other caveats needed work on this thing. I mean, frankly, uh, it's it just absolutely good. But they're also technicians, right? The people who built this magnificent telescope, and especially its sun shield, I met some of these technicians, right? Very sophisticated technicians. Some of them uh, frankly, of these engineers and, and so forth, as scientists are uh, specialists in cameras, in solid state science and so forth. So, so that's one way to talk about just 10,000. The other way to talk about is, I'll use the number 10. So there, when the telescope started, uh, you know, the development started, there were 10 things that are now in space and are working, 10 entirely new technology areas that we didn't know about. So in other words, somebody said, hey, I wanna build this telescope and it needs to go all the way to that infrared range. There was no sensor that could do that with enough, kind of as we call it, quantum efficiency, with enough kind of sensitivity to do it. Had to be invented. Somebody said, well, the only way we can do this is if we protect that telescope and uh, protect this kind of, have this sun shield that is as big as a, tele as a tennis court in area well, but one of them will not do it. We need five of them. That was wow. not invented. We needed to invent it. And a third thing is somebody says, well, if you have six and a half meters, it does not fit into any rocket. So we need to fold it. So we need to learn how to fold uh, these mirrors and actually de unfold them and make them then as good as the mirror would have been if it was made out of one piece. It was not invented. There's, I just gave you three. There's seven more. I'll give a third number, then I'll stop. And that is the number 20. And that is how many years it really took, you know, from the moment that uh, uh, to get started with this. Uh, you, you can go argue whether it should be 22 or whatever, but kind of 20 is largely the numbers. It's really, you know, for many of the people, it's their life's work that they poured into this. 20 years, and what was the total cost? Uh, if you look at it, kind of 
the, the money spent from the beginning all the way to launch and where we are right now is $8.6 billion. Uh, but of course, we want to spend more money. And the simple reason for that, now we have a telescope out there. Now we want to pay scientists and engineers to run that telescope and make all the discoveries that change our uh, uh, you know, understanding of the universe. By the time everything is said and done, it's closer to $10 billion. Uh, dollars. So it's a magnificent uh, in, uh, you know, investment in this. And I just want to say, as a, as a, both as a taxpayer, but also in my job here, I just, I'm so glad that the United States is spending the treasures on these magnificent kind of inspiring things, whether it's the Apollo program, whether it, it's this and kind of other big things, you know, vaccine research or whatever it may be, looking at our own planet, it's these big ideas that really move us forward. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the price of science. That's the price of advancing our civilization. So I totally agree with you. If you're going to spend money, it's on learning where we come from and really where we're going. Uh, you know, you've talked all about the science and the engineering. You know, with regards to the development and deployment, the scale of calculation strategy, all the degree of chance that can happen when you do something like this, it, it really seems hard to comprehend because there's really no margin for error. What was it like to watch the James Webb telescope launch, deploy, and go through the initial calibrations? I'm really glad to, uh, you asked that. So, so first of all, you know, when somebody says we launch a, a, a spacecraft on a given rocket, what's the likelihood it will work just to launch alone? Uh, usually, kind of the number that we give each other is 95 to 97 percent. That's just statistically speaking, that's what's working. So you go see what's the risk of this. You know, three percent times eight and a half billion is a large number, right? Yeah, it's more money than I'll ever earn, right? So kind of for me, it's just like I have to tell you, I was really nervous uh, sitting there at that launch, and I, I want to tell you that the European team, again, this is an international collaboration with Europe and. Uh, the Canadian Space Agency, it's just uh, incredible. We, you know, it was kind of a, a brother and sisterhood coming together as one and uh, seeing it launch. Now, the trick is, in most missions, when launch is over, most of the risk is over, right? You know, from then on, it's kind of uh, going forward. I would argue that the launch in this case was less than 20% of the risk. All the other risks came from deploying this telescope, uh, you talked about it, right? It's kind of, you've seen the movie Transformer, right? It's, it's, you know, like it looks like whatever, a car, and then it turns into this monster. Well, think of it the same way here. So it, it, it's up there kind of in that tip of the rocket, frankly, only two and a half inches from each side. It, if it really is not exactly the max weight it can be, it could not be any heavier for it to, to lift it. And then what needed to happen is on the over the time scale of two to three weeks, a deployment, the likes, I mean, I have to tell you, I lost sleep over that. And, and, and the only reason, frankly, I'm, you know, okay is because I started to really trust the team because I got to know this amazing team. But, you know, you're into sports, uh, you know, uh, you never know the team until when they're on the field. And what I've seen here, that deployment, it worked seamlessly, frankly. You know, the 344 single point failures, so a single point failure, that's our way of saying. Uh, and if something does not work there, the whole mission is a failure. So if we land on Mars, the number of single point failures is usually like 90. So this was 344, just for you to get a sense. Every one of them had to work. And of course, we're sitting here and everything did work. Uh, we're not done yet. We still have a little bit of mountain to climb. But God, I sleep a lot better when I think about work today. <laughs> I mean, tell us exactly where does it orbit? People, I don't think, understand where the James Webb Telescope orbits. And also, wh how was that position chosen? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, so think of being at midnight, you know, midnight, and look up exactly towards the south, right? Kind of, so really, kind of the opposite direction. If you looked at the globe, the opposite direction of noon. So kind of the, the darkest side of, of the Earth, so to say, uh, back there, a million miles is what is called a Lagrangian point. It's one of those points. There's a handful of them that where the gravitational field and the kind of centrifugal forces balance. So you can put something there and it largely stays there and it rotates with the Earth around the sun 
without drifting away, right? So we put it there. Uh, and they say, why would you put it there? And well, first of all, it's because of the fact that it needs to be so incredibly cold. We want the sun and the earth and the moon and everything to be on the other side of the sun shield. So in other words, it is, is entirely, uh, we want to be so cold, all these things, all the warm things, we want on the same side of the sun shield. And we never want it to change. So it's down there is perfect. And, uh, and the distance, uh, it just turns out that million miles is actually really good. We have a, quite a big antenna up there and it can link up with our deep space network as the earth goes by, right? Because if there's, you know, Madrid uh, and then Canberra and then uh, Goldstone, you know, United States, Spain and Australia go by and kind of each one of them. Uh, every day we're using all three of these antennas to dump the data down. Now tell us how far is that, just for people who may not understand, compared to the moon? Well, so the moon is only something like 20% uh, or so of the distance, right? So kind of it's farther than the moon by quite a bit. Uh, and uh, and uh, basically another way of saying it's uh, basically 1% the distance from the earth to the sun. So it's, wow. uh, so it's, 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 it's uh, kind of, that, that's how I would talk about it. Yeah. So it's, it's much farther than the moon. Now, you mentioned the importance of it being super cold. Explain yeah. why that's so important. I was reading about it, and I found it very interesting, but maybe our readers don't understand why it needs to be so frigid. So if you want to detect heat radiation from the universe, especially that's all the way so old, of course, you cannot detect that next to a fire, right? Because what would happen if you see these faint, kind of faint, faint, uh, uh, you know, things kind of next to something hot or even something at room temperature, it would absolutely flood. The own radiation from the telescope would actually absolutely flood the entirety of the signal. So the only way to get there, and this is a really interesting law of physics, it's, it's actually really interesting, that radiation that something emits goes to the fourth power of the temperature. Wow. So which is another way of saying temperature times temperature times temperature times temperature, temperature. So if you if you cool down, the your own radiation drops like a rock. So so you want to go as cold as you possibly can. So there's an instrument there that is single digit Kelvin. So six Kelvin. So remember, zero Kelvin is absolute zero. Nothing can be colder in the universe that's colder than that. And it's six uh, degrees over. Of course, we're up here sitting at 200 and some Celsius, you know, uh, you know, you know, so, so the point is it's absolutely cold and it needs to be cold again because we want to detect these faint heat signatures from the deep universe. So, so fascinating. You know, people might wonder what is the maintenance that's required and how long do you expect this telescope to be operational? Does it have a half-life, a shelf-life, however you want to call it? So, um, so we have an incredibly committed team. I just want to tell you, I just talked to them. Just, I mean, literally, uh, I turned around, just I came here to talk to you after talking to the team. And, and I, you know, I couldn't be more proud of them. You know, they deployed this thing. And, you know, they're dealing with this telescope like it's their baby, frankly, right? So they're, they're deep care to it. I mean, it's kind of, you, you should see it. It's kind of that, you see it in their eyes, you know. They know that they're, in charge of one of the most magnificent investments of humanity ever, right? And so that's exactly how they're dealing with it. So every day, uh, there basically are two shifts that were, were basically for 16 hours, right? Or even 20 hours per day, depending on how urgent it is. Individuals are looking at this telescope, make sure it's doing exactly right. And, and everything is there. So for example, what are they doing today? We're just going through one of those micrometeorite clouds that, uh, you know, like when a comet goes through the solar system, mm -hmm. you see the tail and there are little dust grains that are floating around. You don't see them anymore after the comet is by, they're still there. And of course, that magnificent kind of telescope back there, you know, the question is, does it see these dust things? And of course, the answer is yes. And we'll see some of them, frankly, we calculated and made the, telescope robust enough so it can handle that. So that's what they're doing today. We have a timeline, a minimum a lifetime of five years. Uh, kind of, uh, we expected life of 10, but the Europeans did such a great job injecting this into orbit that the fuel, which is one limiter of life, 
is not a limiter anymore for 10 years. We can, we think we can, based on how, what we know about the telescope, we can probably fly that telescope for 20 years. So then wow. there's other things that start becoming lifetimes. I just talked about the micrometeorites, kind of, you know, like, you know, what will that be? And then, you know, uh, kind of just the mechanisms when, you know, like you have, when you have, uh, you know, at home, kind of a lawnmower or something where you just use it many times, after a while, you know, kind of there's fatigue, right? Kind of the question just really is, this is of course much more sophisticated, but nonetheless, the science of material fatigue, right? And, and, and mechanisms is still there. We think between 10 and 20 years, that's what I would say. And so you talked about the infrared um, information that it's absorbing. What other information is this telescope obtaining for us to use? So it's, it's really looking at the far near infrared. That's what it's the, you know, designed to do. But it's looking at all the way from the far universe. Now, it turns out that that is a really good place to see other emissions. You know, like if you look at, for example, water, uh, you know, somewhere in our galaxy, in some atmosphere, remember water is H2O and kind of the hydrogen hangs from the oxygen and they swing. You know, it's like, think of them like kind of little strings attached to them. They swing and they emit light uh, in, in these molecules emit lights. So does ozone, so does nitrogen and do and so forth. It turns out that emission is precisely also in that wavelength range. So we can actually detect uh, atmospheres of exoplanets. And of course, what you know what the question has been with humans for millennia is, is there life er anywhere else than on Earth? And, and the answer today is we don't know. We've not found any, any right, uh, in the solar system or beyond. So it's those kind of questions that the telescope can also go after. How about the big question, which I think any lay person would ask, how far can this telescope see? I mean, any telescope you want to know, what is the range? What's the answer to that question? Yeah, so kind of the way I always talk, right? So you look at the sun, it took the light that is in your eye when you look out, and, and no, don't look straight into the sun, you get my point, but it took that uh, light about uh, eight to nine minutes to get uh, to the Earth. Okay, so if we look, so that's the distance, the sun or Earth, the light that we're looking at, now hold on to your seat, took 13.5 billion years to come here. That's how far away. So in other words, so that's the distance. So it's, so it's, it's massively longer than the sun. It's frankly to the, the very edge of the observable universe where the first stars and galaxies were. <coughs> Another way of talking about it is the age of the universe. So it's all the way like 200, 100 to 200 million years from the beginning of the universe, right? With that uh, kind of emission of that radiation. Uh, we refer to that as big bang, right? Kind of that kind of initial kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of violent start, if you want. So it's 200 million years or so uh, since then, right? So that's, those are the two ways I would think about it. I mean, so let's get into that because that's just a crazy concept. Most people can't really comprehend that. This telescope is able to look back in time, essentially, yeah. because, because the light and the infrared information that it's getting was emitted almost 13 and a half billion years ago. Exactly right. So, so think of the, you know, the universe, kind of think of it like, you know, you built, you know, if you, I don't know whether you've ever made bread, you know, with, with yeast, you know, kind of the bread kind of inflates, you kind of, you put something in that's much more skinny and then it comes out and inflates. So think of the universe as constantly inflating, uh, you know, like kind of moving, moving out. So kind of from the beginning, the universe has done that and we can observe kind of everywhere in the universe, we can see these galaxies flying away from us, right? And so, so basically, the farther you look, the longer uh, it, you know, the farther back in time you look, right? Get off the, get off the things that took off earlier, right, are out there. So we're going all the way uh, that way. So the way I think about it, you know, you look at me, you're a doctor, right? I'm a little bit north of 50, right? I'm 53 or whatever years old. I, every year it changes. So, so, uh, so, but that's, uh, that's what I am. So kind of, Think of, you know, what would be the pictures of my life you would want to see to kind of see the equivalent. The answer is uh, roughly when I was a few months old. So it's really the baby pictures of the universe that we're, that we're getting 
from this uh, from this telescope. So that's that's how we think about it. Now, so we are close. It sounds like a couple hundred million years, as close as that is, to seeing the Big Bang. I mean, are, do you think in our lifetime we'll be able to see information emitted from the Big Bang? So let's talk about this kind of go, go backwards in time. So you have kind of around us, we're sitting in a galaxy called the Milky Way. If you're in a really dark spot, you see that kind of white band across the sky. And then, of course, there's many, many more galaxies. By the way, that's only was figured out uh, at the beginning of last century, kind of in the early 1900s. Hubble and others figured that out. So you go back in time, and we just talked about the first galaxies and stars, 100, uh, 200 million years. What's actually interesting before that, there's really gases and so forth that are there. And frankly, I want you to know, we're actually going to take a shot at it in, 20, in 24, and we're going to put a, a little sensor on the far side of the moon. And frankly, that's another crazy idea because the far side of the moon in many ways is the quietest place. It's cold. It's, it's terribly cold, just like a web. But it's also away from all radio sources, right? The Earth, all the giant planets. So we're going to try to see that. Now, what's really interesting, we already observed the Big Bang. So the big, so we observed the Big Bang and a lot of nothing, 200 million years and, and nothing else. So what we observed the Big Bang, it's actually uh, two Penzias and Wilson got the Nobel Prize for that. It's the background radiation. What they figured out, they, they were actually, it was totally stumbled onto it. If you look into the sky, uh, kind of in all directions, it doesn't matter where you are, there's a faint radio emission that is there. And frankly, think of it as like, you know, you've heard kind of fireworks on the 4th of July, like there's a bang and then you hear kind of like that, that echo, kind of the echo that is spreading. So that background, it turns out, is the echo of the Big Bang. And, you know, so, so we've, uh, we've mapped some of them. Actually, one of our good scientists, John Mather, uh, won the Nobel Prize for uh, the details of it. So, so the point is, we have learned about the Big Bang. Uh, there's stuff we want to learn about what led to it, frankly. The first, right after the Big Bang, the first few milliseconds, something really crazy happens called inflation. We, we know nothing about except in theory. Then we have a big gap. And, uh, and basically right now, the closest is kind of a billion years or even two billion years, right? So, so we want to get all the way to 100 to 200 million years. So that's, that's kind of where we are. I mean, and then the even crazier question is, will we ever know what was there before the Big Bang? Ah, that's a, that's a good one. And, you know, the, talking about messing with your mind, right? You know, that's exactly you know, right. The, the, big, the Big Bang is, of course, where space and time arises. And the word before only makes sense in a, time, in, a, in a world in which time matters, right? Because I look, well, when the dial was here, it was before. What I remember was before. I don't remember the future, right? So there's... There's uh, interesting questions, and, and I don't know. I think there are uh, theories out there that, uh, that make predictions about kind of, uh, you know, for example, they say, hey, there's many, many different Big Bangs that can occur in many parallel universes. And if that's the case, the question is, how can we actually measure it in a given single universe? So, so there's not a measurement right now that is kind of... Uh, that really would answer that. But, you know, uh, I don't think it's an irrational question at all. I think it's one of those things where, where we need to develop the theory and really figure out what, what the indications will be. And uh, that's, I mean, we're not, we're not there. Yeah, I mean, just like you were saying that it kind of messes with your mind. I think asking human beings to understand the Big Bang and before the Big Bang is like asking an ant to do calculus. It's just, your mind just can't even grasp those concepts. So it's, it's super interesting. So, you know, people are going to say, so you're getting all this new information. What a great, you know, technological advancement. What existential questions will this information help us answer eventually? It really is the two questions you said at the beginning. You know, where, are, where did we come from? Uh, and uh, is there a life out there? But for me, those now, I don't think, well, you know, like these kind of questions, by the way, they're simple questions, right? They're, they sound like, I mean, it's obvious questions. Sometimes people answer those questions with, uh, with other tools, right? Philosophy, uh, even religion. Uh, some of these questions we can answer with the tools of science, right? I mean, 
Uh, so medical doctor, you know, genetics is, you know, where did we come from relates to that question, right? Where's your DNA? What, you know, like there's important uh, uh, research you can do. And, and I think that what, what uh, web will really do is really add important uh, answers to that question. And of course, elucidate other questions that relate to that, that we don't know. Is there life out there is the one that really relates to these other planets. And, and frankly, I'm not sure whether we'll really say there is life there, but I think uh, just uh, what we've learned about Mars, we know about Mars. We did not know that when I studied P my PhD, right? We know today Mars did have the environment that could habit life. We did not know that, right? Uh, you know, we le learned that in the last 20 years. And so for us, that's what we really like to see in the next few years about these other planets. So those are the two most fundamental, the simplest questions we can think of, you know, the kind of stuff that, as you said, messes with our minds because they're so simple, but yet so fundamental. Yeah, I mean, it makes you realize that we're just such kind of insignificant individuals in such a larger existence. And, you know, wrapping up here, just because I know you're super busy, give us your crystal ball for the next five, 10, 20 years. What major advancements do you predict for NASA? Well, I believe in the next 20 years, uh, we will be on Mars with astronauts and we'll uh, explore that world uh, with robots and with humans uh, together. We may be on the way uh, to go to other worlds. You know, Titan would be a place I'd like to go to. Uh, you know, uh, you can use airplanes there, right? Uh, because it has an atmosphere that's even thicker than uh, the Earth. In the next 20 years, I believe, uh, and I cannot prove that. This is me, Thomas, sitting here. I believe uh, we will know whether there's life elsewhere because we will have discovered it. I'm saying that not because I absolutely know. I'm just looking at the trends. What we learned in the last 20 years is incredible in this. We didn't have any other planets since till 1995. We have thousands now. We didn't know that Mars had water. We know now. We, you get my point. Kind of Enceladus, Europa, these ocean world, they're all new discoveries and we have organics, we have complex organics. We know from biology that's on the, on the uh, stage to life. So, so I would say that's the second one. The third one uh, I would talk about is really about our own planet. I think in the next 20 years, important decisions are made by us uh, about our own planet, the health that we, uh, that planet has, of course, and we leave for our children and their children uh, behind it. Uh, what has happened is space has transformed our understanding of our planet both the beauty, but also the importance of uh, our planet, the one system that we share with all of our fellow humans. And, and I think kind of that, uh, that uh, kind of uh, in the next 20 years, that discussion will fundamentally change as we go forward. We, the oceans will have gone up three to five inches uh, over, over that time period. And uh, many other things uh, will be changing as a result of that. Our assets in space, will serve us on the ground in the next 20 years. God, it's such an exciting time. Um, you know, wrapping up here again, I know you're super busy. What an amazing interview, just awe-inspiring technology. Uh, crazy to think the kind of questions we're going to be able to answer about our universe and where we came from. And again, much respect to you and all of your colleagues over at NASA uh, for really pushing the frontiers of science. Kudos to all of you. And thanks well, again I really for your time. Appreciate I really appreciate it. Thanks to you. And again, it's all about the teams. Uh, big things are done by teams. And I really Always. appreciate I appreciate your team, your time, and, uh, and uh, your interest in us and everybody who's listened here. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks again. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.